So, um, yeah, like I said, thank you for coming on here. This is an honor and a pleasure for me, Stephen. You're welcome. Listen, I have a question for you right off the top that I don't usually ask, but uh, I'm going to ask this time. You you mentioned that the stuff I do is, I think you used the word unusual or unique. Unique, unique yeah. Yeah, unique, yeah. So I'm very curious, what, uh, what do you find unique about what I've been doing? It's your, I guess, unrelenting realism at the event of our death. The way that you speak about our inevitable demise is powerful, to say the least. And like I said, very, uh, I guess, realistic. And I don't know how else to explain it. I don't know how mm -hmm. else to really touch upon that. But it's very like, um, it's, it's, I guess it's something that we need to hear, but not necessarily something that we all want to hear, per se. True. You know what I mean? I, I do. Yeah. Yeah, that's how I have any kind of a, a calling at all is uh, it's, it's based on resistance, sadly. I mean, it's not something I went looking for, but... Uh, it turns out that if, I mean, I, I guess I would say I discovered in my time in the trenches that if, if people really wanted things to be different than what they are, they would be different. Mm. That's a very telling and sobering thought to think that we are getting the deal that basically that we bargain for when we're not in the trenches, when everything is going more or less okay, when you're reasonably uh, healthy, when you're, as Freud called it, normally unhappy, hmm. then, you know, we, we strike a certain bargain, a certain deal with, the, with uh, the great beyond as we understand it. And, uh, you know, things cash out pretty much exactly that way. And that's the only reason I had any kind of job at all, I think. So you're saying your job, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to touch upon that. This is actually yeah. how I was kind of going to start the conversation, right? So you, yeah. I've heard you say before that being born in troubled times, i.e. the times that we're in, mean yeah. almost we have like an assignment at birth, almost like there's, this is my words, like a servitude, right? We become like servants to the times that we're in, right? Almost like the times needed our birth right it's not an affliction we're not quite the victims per se right so what do you feel is your assignment here what is your as they say in the east your dharma right what what is stephen jenkinson here to do in the time that you're alive hmm. um the temptation of the question is that i would answer in in uh, hypothetical terms but actually I've been at it for quite a while, so I think I can report rather than hypothesize about, about that. I guess um, I'm here to faithfully report on the state of affairs. Mm. doesn't sound like very much, and I suppose it isn't very much, but... <clears throat> Uh, this really came to me in, in strong terms when I was working in the death trade, and I, I saw that the language that people employed, I mean, the dying people, their families, their close, you know, their close friends, their the paid professionals, everybody up and down the line employed a kind of language where the realities of dying just disappeared, just without a trace disappeared. And everybody deemed that to be compassion. That's what it was called, mm. compassionate care, or it was called uh, patient-centered care or client-centered care. That was the technical term for the operation. Mm. And the idea being is people, everybody else took their cue from the inclination of the, uh, of the dying person. Now, if you happen to be a product of a death phobic culture, and now it's your turn to die, do you think the death phobia is likely to show up at all? in how you conduct yourself? And if it is, do you think that's what we were taking dictation from? From the unwillingness to die, from the unwillingness to know the realities and, and to learn the facts 
I don't mean the biomedical facts. I mean the big picture, existential, philosophical, mythic, and poetic facts. Do you think the disinclination to learn the facts would lead the charge? Of course it would. And it did. And that's where I found myself. So it wasn't hard for me to make up or come up with a, a reason for being there. And it was simply to see if I could craft a language where the realities of dying appeared. That's all. Mm. That's all I did. That's all that uh, uh, Die Wise, the book I wrote about it. That's all it's really attempting to do. It's not about that. It is that. You see, I'm not, I'm not pointing somewhere else with Die Wise and saying, well, if you look over there, I'm, I'm, I'm making this gesture with Die Wise with my palms up and the gesture offering anybody who's willing to see it the chance to see it without having to go through the, um, the accreditation and the abomination that I went through to be there. And, uh, you know, there, there are certainly people who are kind in response to what they read there and what they hear me say. But I think the lion's share of people, you know, what I do leaves them cold. That's my impression, leaves them cold. Yeah. And it's lamentable to me because um, so much is riding on what we bring to the third act of our little three-act play, hmm. really and truly. So much, there's so many consequences for the generations to come in how we do this. But you'd never friggin' know it from the way it's uh, you know undertaken. Just like now it's bring on the ayahuasca, bring on the mushrooms, bring on the peyote and Let's have ourselves a time. Hmm. Yeah. Touching upon the uniqueness of your message, I think that also what you just described, um, kind of that extenuates the uniqueness even more is that the, our death has consequences and the way that we approach it as consequences that I've never heard from anybody else. And especially in the mm -hmm. way that you put it so poetically and, eloquently. I, I've never heard that from seriously anybody else. The way that we approach it has not only consequences for your own being, living and dying, but all yeah. those around you and society as a whole. That Well, sure. Your consequences last longer than you do. Yeah. There it is. In a nutshell, there it is. That's your real, that's the real bequest you have. That's what you're giving over. You know, that's, that's the, um, the slag heap left in your wake is really how you did it, how you kind of did it, how you half-assedly did it, how you refused to do it, how you, you know, objected vehemently against it, how you went via the great grief bypass that is so available now, how you tried to make your death your death instead of something that was entrusted to you in the same way, of course, that we make anything we own ours instead of something that was entrusted to us, like a piece of ground or an animal or, I mean, by no means should these things be understood to be possessions. And yet when it comes to your dying, man, oh man, it's the three ring circus of your ownership. That's what dying is. Huh. Hmm. Yeah. So you're saying is almost in our, way that we approach it is a a selfishness to the death and that is only i mean you said there was like there's three parts right there's three acts in in life and that's that's probably a, a great reflection also of how we approach this life as well there's a sense of like selfishness and egotism that is prevalent in our society so is so the essence is yeah approach your death with a sense of selflessness right but then you could also probably translate that and reflect that into your you know the, the goings on of our lives here as well right would you say that's kind of like an extension of your philosophy from that i'm not sure about the the accusation of selfishness uh, and i'll tell you why i think the view that certain things are selfish might be that what selfish is what do I mean? I mean that I'm not persuaded. This is going to sound a little Eastern, and I'm not that way inclined, but 
it'll probably sound that way. I'm inclined to imagine that there's really no such thing as what we Western people mean by a self. I mean, it's not to say we don't bargain for it, we don't gamble upon it, we don't employ it and manipulate it and manipulate with it and all the rest. That's all true. But I'm not sure that that for all of that, it makes it so. Yeah. And so th there's not really a self to serve. You see, you're given, you're granted a certain amount of time. You don't know how long it's going to be, but you know it's limited. That's enough to know. I mean, strange as that sounds, I'm fairly sure that if you knew the day and the hour of your death, it would make you nuts. Hmm. The knowledge itself would make you nuts. There's something genuinely uh, graceful and benevolent about the fact that the arrangement goes like this. You don't get to know when, so you're spared that. But you do get to know if hmm. you're not spared that. Hmm. You can translate the second one. You really can. You can trans. That's your job to translate knowing that you will die into living, not waiting for somebody to give you a terminal diagnosis. And now magically the clock's ticking. And now magically, you know, you'll find some way to be heroic and a real stand up guy. That's not really the time for you to figure that stuff out. You got to, excuse me again, your body's got enough to contend with, isn't it? in the downward spiral without having to learn and mock time what this asks of you. But as you and I sitting here now, reasonably uh, um, healthy people, um, we have no, frankly, no excuse. But this self thing, it's all the excuse you need to, you know, to um, go for plan B, anything but that. And I'll tell you the truth. Uh, ongoingly when I was working in the death trade, <laughs> if I tried to bring up anything like you and I are talking about now, nine times out of 10, no exaggeration, the strong reaction would be that this is premature, in bad taste, out of keeping, not called for right now. Mm. There will be a time when all of these things would, you know, have their moment. This is not their moment. Uh, we'll let you know when it is. And of course, nobody ever did because they were wrong about that. It is the moment. The fact that you don't feel like it is you being a slave to that self thing. Hmm. Yeah. You know, yourself doesn't feel like it, but yourself's not really the boss. Dying's the boss. And if you have a sense that maybe, you know, the scale is tipped, maybe you're not on the front end or the first act of your three-act play. Maybe you have a sense that you're into the second act of your three-act play. And you, you may say to yourself, ah, oh, lots of time. But you don't know what that means. I mean, I got friends in England this weekend. They're burying their 11-year-old son. You don't know. Yourself doesn't know any more than you do. Yourself's not a genius. You know, yourselves panting after satisfaction. You know, it's understandable. It's not a capital offense, but it's, but it's not really wise. It's like imagining that you have kids around the house, imagining that they know what's good for them. So giving them every week, giving them, you know, 50 bucks and sending them to the food store and getting them, let them get what they want. That's what the self being in charge, that's how it works out. Yeah. Yeah. So if life is in charge, in, the, in, in this case, in the form of dying, then life gets to have its way with you. you know, and, it, and it clearly means you no harm. I mean, very clearly. But just as clearly, it's got your address, though. <laughs> right? It, doesn't, it hasn't mistaken you for somebody else. And if you're willing to look down the, the long and winding road of your days, you can recognize something of the life that's entrusted to you in your willingness to remember clearly. And if you do that, then the third act becomes a, it's your
grace time. Mm. That's when you begin to act with a sense of decorum and purpose. And you understand, as you've put it so beautifully, you understand that the consequences that ensue are going to last longer than you. You're not in charge of the consequences or what they mean, but you're certainly consequential. And so it becomes a sense of responsibility. Yeah, kind of burden, that's there. But more than burden, a sense of occasion. You know, you have a sense that, that of, of the five people who are confused about what the etiquette should be sitting there with you in your death room, there's one person, at least, who's listening very intently in spite of themselves to what comes out of you. And you know when it's their turn 20 or 30 or 40 years from now, they're going to need recourse to what you're saying and the example that you're giving. And that's how you carry yourself. Wow. After that, the self comes third or fourth down the list. Yeah. Well said, Stephen. Mm -hmm. So do you feel that there is a sense of... Um almost obligation to surrender to this deity of death, this, uh, this boss, as you called it, the boss <laughs> of our demise. Do you feel yeah. that we, as, as human beings, there is a sense of uh, surrender to this and almost reverence to it? Um, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, I don't know if I'd use the word surrender if you're talking to a Western humanist tradition audience. If you're talking to Anglo-North Americans, surrender is not a big seller. No. Definitely it sounds not. good. It sounds good until you try to take a knee and then you find out you're just your 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 psyche has arthritis in all the places you should be able to bend. <laughs> right? Yeah. So so maybe not surrender. Maybe I chose the slightly more neutral word learn earlier. Uh -huh. And that's what I'd advocate now. You 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 learn its ways. You know, it's it's clearly not going anywhere. I mean, you do as much for a stranger washed up on your shore. Take, for example, what happened that years ago when they had that 9-11 thing in the States and, uh, and all the, the planes are grounded, right? So people got ended up, as it happened in Newfoundland, a lot of planes were grounded in Newfoundland. And the locals took all these people out of the airports and into their houses and took care of them for days until the flights were rescheduled and all the rest. And turned into a Broadway play called Come From Away, I think, something like that. And uh, you do as much for a stranger, you might as well do it for your, for your death. Mm -hmm. You might as well learn it. You might as well learn its, its ways, you know, its appetite, its, uh, its tendency. Learn how it responds to chemotherapy. Learn how it responds to the, the angling for more time and for being hopeful in spite of all the other signs. Things like that. That's what you could do. And it wouldn't be a waste of time. Yeah. But it's not, it's not a good idea to wait until you got your incontinent, your slack jawed and drooling in your bed. That's not a good time to, to think that you're going to take up this task. You know, there is such a thing amongst grownups as too late. I don't know how many times I've said that phrase, man, but there's still no sign that there's takers for the notion of too late. It's just distinctly un-North American, too late. But I mean, ecologically and climate science-wise, is there such a thing as too late? Could we be there? So if it's true at the macro level, you know it's probably true at the micro level too, that there's such a thing as too late, that you don't want to wait. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. So once we befriend our demise, our inevitable demise, what would you say that grants us in our life? What is that? What does that open us up to? What does that enable us to live on? Like, what, what frequency wavelength does that allow us to to live with once we accept yeah. our death? Not even accept, but once we yeah. recognize it, know it's you know, know it's a thing to just simply yeah. know. Yeah, it's a it's a good imagining your question is, but it's got a little bit of a dead end in it. So I'd like to <laughs> dead end. like to flush that out. So yeah, it's a dead end. There's a dead end in the question. The notion that once we figure it out, once we learn it, once we get it straight, 
then and then the rest of your question flows from that hy- hypothetical. But I'm suggesting to you that moment never really happens. You're never sitting there going, right, uh-huh. got it. Now. Yeah. Is it, now it's a le- time for a left turn. I don't think so. I think the whole thing of learning it is learning your limitations in the face of it. Not eg- exercising your capacity for omniscience. You know, you don't really, you don't really get it straight. You get hints. You translate, or as I've said so many times when I sign people's books, uh, pray. No, was it? <laughs> Bless, work, repeat. Mm. That's the program. Bless, work, repeat. And it's very distinct, me trying to separate blessing from working. Not that they're not related. Of course, they're related. But you can't do one without the other. But man, they have to be understood as distinct enterprises. And they both deserve your clear and unvarnished attention, you know. And we're, I tell you, uh, you know, I've done so many interviews and what I'm about to say has not come up very often. And it's prob- it's possible that I'm getting to the end of having anything to say in an interview format any longer. But we're capable of better. Honest to God. I mean, I've seen so many things that would lead me to conclude the opposite of that. But I'm still out- utterly persuaded that things could be could be different. Could could genuinely be better. But they're not, not, and that's where I live. In that, in that, but how to translate it? What does it mean? What? Why are we so seemingly unwilling to learn the things that don't go along with our, our, the take on things we develop when we're seven years old? I mean, you you surrender the physical frailties of your seven year old self. Well, why don't you surrender the psychic and the poetic frailties of your seven-year-old self in the same fashion? Why do you hold on to them for dear life until they form up your understanding of what it means to love and to to cherish and to uh, you know sustain and support? And well, I don't. It's such a mystery that they have such a claim upon us in a way that the physical manifestations, being seven or ten, never do. Mm. Even with, if you had polio as a kid or leukemia as a kid and you got through it, you know, at some point when you're 47, you may have some, some holdover from having gone through that as a kid, sure. But you wouldn't say that your body is utterly predetermined and, and obeying in every way possible, you know, all the damage, all the hardship all the pain and the fearfulness that accrued to your young body at the time. No, no, you would have found ways to be more than that. That's all. Not leave it behind, but you know, you're capable of more. You ask more of yourself and you do more than those limitations would suggest. And yet the heart, I mean, listen to the industry known as trauma today. And observe the claim it makes upon people. And you realize, my God, you know, the claim that a seven-year-old hurt makes eclipses any claim a uh, seven-year-old physical misshapenness makes. And that's so mysterious. Mm. Yeah. So you're saying that we're capable of much more. And we almost innately have that essence within us just as a birthright in a way yet we grow out of that is what you're saying or we're molded out of that in a way from our world that seems so far gone is that what you're saying like we're almost like we have that within us that essence that you described that you know that you know you touched upon that we're, we're the human spirit i guess you could say is capable of of being much more than what we're uh what we're currently doing at a collective and individually, but there's something that goes awry 
in our upbringing that is a mystery to you that doesn't it just doesn't it doesn't make sense it just, why we we just don't we lose our way in a way you know what i mean we lose track of that essence you're is that what you were getting at <laughs> yes that's an element for sure yeah i'm i'm thinking that um, to add to what you said that I'm not talking about all people and all places across all times. Not at all. I'm talking about the little corner of the world that I know. Mm -hmm. We're, we seem to be looking for ways of losing our way. Huh. Yeah. Like we do it to ourselves. They, they have, well, there's no cabal, man. I mean, I know there's bad guys. I grant you there's bad guys. Yeah. But the bad guys aren't responsible for what you and I are talking about now. They're the they're the beneficiaries of that, to be sure. Um, but they're not the architects. Mm. No, there's a, a song I came across six or eight months ago when I was wasting my life watching YouTube one time. <laughs> and uh uh, Jason Isbell is the guy's name, I-S-B-E-L-L. -L. And the song's called 24 Frames, um, meaning, meaning things happen so fast in 24 frames. And, and the, the uh, what do you call it, the chorus says, you thought that God was an architect, but now you know. He's something like a pipe bomb ready to blow. And all those things you got for show go up in flames in 24 frames. It's quite sobering, no? You thought that God was an architect, but now you know. Now, I don't agree with the characterization that God is a pipe bomb ready to blow. He's sitting in a black car ready to go. That's another part of the phrase. I don't think so. But, um, but there's something in our unwillingness to get it right that sounds very much like a pipe bomb ready to blow. Wow. Because you only get so, so much time, you see. You only get so many chances, you know, to glimpse the real thing. I mean, all of the big books, all of the teachings in the world seem to, among other things, whisper that fact. Listen, there's only so many times this, this comes around. Hmm. Yeah. I mean, it's important to say that the, civil, the civilization has ended more than once hmm. already, right? The world has ended more than once. I mean, the fossil record and the geolo uh, uh, geolo geological record certainly testify to that. And um, so we, we wouldn't be unusual in ending with a bang or a whimper it wouldn't be the first time it's happened on this little you know piece of rock whirling around the sun but we might be unique in being the only beings who brought it down upon ourselves mm -hmm. and had plenty of warning that that's what we were doing and did so anyway so at the risk of sounding fatalistic what i'm saying is this is observable and hard to take at the level of climate and ecology. I grant you, it, and it is, it's hard to take. But the self-same thing is playing itself out each and every ordinary day when the opportunities for you to get it right, not to be right, but to get it right, <clears throat> are presented to you on an ordinary platter, right? Not silver and gold, just ordinary formica platter. That's how it comes to you. Nothing that spectacular. And then it just says to you, any questions? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So let's go down that route. How would you describe getting it right in an ordinary manner? You know, like... You know, because we're talking a little bit grandiose here. So if we can take it down a notch to 
anyone listening, they're like, well, well, okay, well, what is there to be done in one's life? You know, how do we really take that essence of what we just spoke about, of learning and uh, hopefully reorienting ourselves into our regular life? Like, how would you, how could you describe that for somebody if somebody were to inquire to you or literally right now inquire to you? Well, I would say, first thing I would say is you were listening for the last 15 minutes were my answer to what you just asked me, right? It's not like I haven't talked about it yet. So now we're on to this thing. So everything leads to this moment. No, no, no. That it was there. It was there in my understanding of, you know, that, that uh, death is a deity, that you only get so many chances, that all of that stuff there. But I keep using the ter term to translate. You know, you still have to translate. You might see, okay? You might get a, a realization that stops you in your tracks. But eventually, you're going to have to take another step. And that next step, in the wake of what you've seen, that's your act of translating. And here's the thing. You will translate. You, you will. But you may be dismayed that your act of translation was not in keeping with the enormity of what you were granted to see. And you may disappoint yourself in a way that you can't barely live with. You see? Yeah. Yeah, the act of translation. The image that was shown in my head was the passage that you probably know and the listeners probably know of the Bhagavad Gita when... Um, Arjuna is shown the world. He's he's begging God, I want to see what are what are you? Show me you, please. I want to know what is this mm. godlike essence. And he opens himself up, and Arjuna is just he's just awestruck by the enormity, the calamity, in a way of of God. Yeah. And then the, he ends with, "I have become death, the destroyer of worlds." That's it. Mm. Seems like I don't know for sure, but it seems like that's the essence that you're somewhat touching upon is that when we when we get that glimpse it may not be what we wanted to see per se but once you see it it's like you can't unsee it and then it's up to us to translate that glimpse into our regular daily lives i don't know which song it is one of marley's songs towards the end of his life uh, how long will they kill our prophets while we stand aside and look you remember that? You've heard it at least. Rings a bell, yeah. Okay. So the the notorious insistence on getting answers that are more affirming, more uh, directing, more clarifying, more rewarding, more appealing. That's how you kill your prophets. It's not that the bad guys aren't always killing the, off the prophets, man. The good guys are doing it too. So here's, here's what I'm saying. If we were in another kind of time, I would have another kind of answer for you. You see? But what I'm, what I'm, the way I'm responding to you doesn't come from me clicking my heels three times together and saying there's no place like home. What I'm saying to you, as faithfully as I can find a way to do, comes from the time we're in. Yeah. If you don't recognize the time you're in and what I'm saying, so be it. You know, it wouldn't, and I'm not saying you can't, not you personally, but I'm saying if one, somebody's listening and they say, you're not an old world this guy's talking about, I say, no problem. You know, we, we're not enemies, but what I can't do is tell you back to yourself. I can't give you your assurances. You already have those and you're still asking me, you see? Yeah. So your assurances aren't working. You don't need me to point that out. And I'm not the guy who's got everything else, everything figured out, everything in its place. Never said I was, never said I was, right? Mm -hmm. But I do know how to wonder about stuff. And I know what part being troubled should play in wondering. Mm. And that's what you're hearing. So I can't 
really apologize for it. I can, I can acknowledge with you that there's a lot more apparently user-friendly ways to respond to these things. I can acknowledge that. Sure, there are. But I've heard a lot of them. And honestly, I saw what it did to dying people to be reassured about their dying. So if we're in a time where our way of life is meeting its maker, I ain't going to do that. And if that's what you meant by unique off the top, maybe that's what it is. But I take no joy in that, you see. I know no sense of pleasure. No sense that, you know, I got it right or anything of the kind. No. But we're not talking about informational clarity here. We're really not. We're talking about <clears throat> how do you live a circumstance that's already a motion that you didn't get a vote on when you were born. That's what we're talking about here, right? Okay, so I'm talking to you. I'm responding back to you as if that's true. We don't have to say it in every sent, every question and every answer for it to be there all the time. It's there all the time. And I'm seeing to it that it's there. I'm not saying anybody else has to answer this way or talk this way, okay? There's lots of people who will tell you how we can get on the other side of all this. So go to them by all means. I don't set myself up against them. I just say, you know, don't go to the hardware store when you're looking for bread. <laughs> That's a good one. Wow. Yeah. Mm. There's a few where that came from. <laughs> yeah. That's why you're unique. You're, like you said in the beginning, you, you, you're offering this relentless realism, but it's up to us to kind of take the offering, right? You're just, you're, you're throwing out, throwing, throwing it out there, no strings attached. It's kind of just like you are, and it's all from experience too. It's not speculation. This is all from your own, your own lived experience over the years. This is, this is an offering to us, no strings attached. And I like that's <laughs> Go ahead. I'm not sure if there's no string. To be really frank, uh -huh. I, I'm I'm aware that there's a kind of oh my godness to certain consequences and certain nuances that I mention. I know there are, and it's it's not lost on me. I mean, I experience it the same way, you know. Mm. But I'm not in my twenties or thirties or forties or fifties, and so I'm in a different place in the order of things. You see. And I don't, I have no obligation to occupy your place in things in order to be able to speak with you. No more than you have an obligation to be my age in order to be able to hear me. That we don't have that. We don't have to imitate each other. That's the echo chamber that you're hearing about so often. Yeah. No? Okay. So instead, we show each other some respect. How do we do that? We say, look. There's, there's a distance to be traveled between what you ask and what I answer, right? And you can't do all the traveling in real time. Some of the traveling has got to happen after the fact. Yeah. You know, when the signal's lost, when the, when the deal goes down, when the, when the machine is off and there's no screen, then you got to do your work, you know, and then you got to decide if it's worth it or you're just going to turn on Netflix again. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Mm. So why do you do this, Stephen? <laughs> <laughs> Bear with me here. I think no, no, that's a good question. I think you're, I was thinking about this the other day. I think you, you're in the running. If you're not number one, you're in the running for the most interviewed person on the internet. And I'm not joking. <laughs> You, I really think you're, you're in the running. You're at least top three. Okay. And I suspect there's something in you that does it for more than just you know, clout and more than just trying to, you know, uh, publicity. Yeah. You know, there's some. I suspect there's something in you that does this for a, a greater reason. So, where does this come from in you to come and talk to some random 
guy from America online or wherever you're talking to people from, uh, you know, yeah. why, why do you do it? Because you ask. Mm -hmm. I know that's not the most satisfying answer, but that's the honest to God answer. I don't, it doesn't go the other way. I don't hustle, you know, and it doesn't make me a superb person to say that. I'm just saying, you know, I'm, it's just the way I'm built. I'm no good at the hustle. So if you didn't ask, you'd never hear from me. So there's one thing that's going on that people are asking, right? And most of them now are younger than me. Just the demographics work that way. So I feel an obligation to people who will outlive me. Mm -hmm. I genuinely do, mm -hmm. you see. And it's just, it's not like I see my own children in, in you. And that's not true. I'm, I'm not mistaking you for somebody else. But I have a sense of what you might be up against in the near future. Yeah. And, you know, I'm not going to be there. And uh, you won't be able to dial me up again. Mm. And so it's now. Yeah. See, it's all or nothing. It's this is it. And I don't think that's, there's nothing narcissistic about saying we're it right now. Now we decide that there's a lot of things at stake. You know, that phrase at stake, we know what it means, how people use it today. But you think about it for five seconds, you know where the phrase comes from. Came from the, comes from the practice of animal sacrifice in the holy precinct. When you tie the animal to a stake driven into the ground and get it still long enough to slit its throat. Wow. That's where it comes from. Yeah. And the word blessing is, it comes from an old Germanic line of words that mean bloodying. That's what they refer to virtually the same thing. That the way you obtain blessing is not by obtaining approval. You obtain blessing. And all the religious people know this. I mean, the deeply religious people, they know this. That blessing is a consequence of certain things that need to end ending. Mm. That's where it comes from. And so I'm in the blessing business, you see. <laughs> But etymologically, I'm not in the approval game. I'm not discounting it. It has its time, you know, but you can get that from a lot of other places. You don't need to get it from me too. Mm. Plus, you know, there's not a lot of gainful employment for people who do what I do. So, so I'm available. Mm. <laughs> mm. Yeah. Yeah. You're blessing us in a way with, a, with your yeah. presence. <laughs> well, I, uh, hopefully <laughs> with, with a translated presence. Yeah. I mean, just not sitting here and smiling at you with my fingers in an interesting position. I'm, <laughs> I'm not that guy, you know, yeah. or, or the, the, the kissing saint or I'm not that guy. Mm. So this is, this is, this is all, but here's the thing. I've been on the receiving end of what I'm describing to you. I didn't invent anything, right? But I've been deeply inspired and disheveled by certain examples of people that came before me that I was lucky enough to meet uh, or to hear or, or to be able to read from them. Mm. And, um, and their example is uh, relentless. And so I take it as a, I mean, and finally, if I haven't told the story too often. So I was trying to be a <clears throat> stone carver when I was in my 20s, late 20s. I trying to make a living at it, which was like in North America is this side of impossible. And so I tried to find some older guy who had been doing it for a while who could sort of show me the ropes, you know, sounded right. And I finally found this guy, and he was in his 80s by this time. He'd been doing it for 60 years. So I said, well, I thought to myself, he's the guy. So I just said, you know, calling you up, hoping you'll let me come over, and you, you just show me the ropes, basically, you know. And he just said to me, uh, you work at this every day? <laughs> and I was busted immediately. One question. And I said, uh, well, I think about it every day. You know, that's as close as I could get to not lying completely. Mm. And he said, really? He said, well, you call me again when you do it every day. And he hung up the phone on me. 
Now, that in and of itself is worth the price of admission many times over. Call me again when you do it every day. So it's just kind of a parable. It's a Jesus thing almost. You know, he said, you, I mean, the first thing you ask yourself is, man, how many days do I have to do it before I'm doing it every day? Mm -hmm. See, mm -hmm. you don't know what the number is. So I decided it was two weeks. It's a joke, but I did. So I called him up and two weeks later. And I said, this is, and he said, yeah, I know who it is. I said, well, it's only two weeks, but I've done it every day and I'm going to do it regardless. And I'm just hoping you, you know, you say yes. And his response went like this. He said, um, okay, uh, you're going to come over. I'm going to tell you everything I know. You're going to be really disappointed because it's not going to take nearly as long as you're hoping. See, but we're going to strike a deal right now. That's my deal, my end of the deal. Your end of the deal is you don't keep anything that I tell you to yourself. Because mm. if you do, and if I'm dead, I'll find you. And I'll haunt your ass to kingdom come. That's literally what he said to me. Wow. Yeah. And so I, I agreed to the terms. And I did come over. And this is another answer to the question, why do I do all the interviews? Because I'm trying to make sure I can sleep at night without being haunted to kingdom come. Wow. Yeah. Now, you could ask, did he tell you all this stuff about dying and deities and shit? And I say, of course not. None of that stuff came up. And then you say, well, well, why are you doing all this in the interviews? And my answer is, I'm translating, baby. <laughs> this is what translating is. He didn't say any of this stuff. He was just talking about his ex-wife a bit and there's different qualities of marble. That was about it. See, but I was standing in the presence of 60 years of that. So the proper thing when you're in the presence of 60 years of something is, excuse my language, eh, but it's, shut the fuck up. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Just listen. Just listen. Yep. Just listen. We need to do a lot more listening, that's for sure. Well, I, I did my share. <laughs> it's just not my, this is not the, the inning for me being quiet, that's all. Mm. But I've done it lots and lots and lots. Mm. Yeah, I think that's why you've earned the right to be the translator. You go from the listener to the translator. You know, you almost like anointed yourself in that way. <laughs> Baby soul, man. <laughs> Yeah. Wow. That was good. That was good. I don't even know where to go from here. That was good, man. <laughs> well, sometimes sometimes you've done, you've hit a home run and the game's not nearly over, but it's good for it to be over with a home run. Maybe, yeah. maybe that's yeah. where we are. Yeah. yeah. I think that's where we're at, Stephen. <laughs> okay. And on a home run. I mean, uh, I hate to ask this, but I ask this with every interview. Uh, do you have any last words? I think I already know what your answer is going to be. You already you already said what you need to say, but do you have any last words for the for the world, for the audience, for this? I just reiterate something I, I said for the first time in my life, maybe 15 minutes ago, that, um, you know, we're looking for the answer, guys. We're looking for the the people are going to clarify we're looking for the the guides the messiahs etc right yeah. it's understandable i'm not saying out of criticism it's understandable but what do you suppose we do when we get them are we satisfied now is it good enough now mm. you know what the answer is like i said earlier i'm going to say it again it's not the bad guys that are killing off the prophets it's the good guys Wow. I'll leave you with that. that. Yeah. On that note, thank you for leaving us with that. Um, Stephen, man, appreciate you. Appreciate your time, your wisdom, your energy, your presence, blessing us with your presence. Um, yeah, man, that this is uh, this was a really good talk. Keep doing your thing. You know, keep 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 on keep it on, man. Um, I wish you all the best. I'll put all of your information down in the description for everybody. But um okay. Yeah, thank you. I don't know. I've said it enough. Thank you. Thank you for your questions. It was really, 
It's really good. And if this happens to be the last one, I wouldn't mind going out on this. It'd be okay. Wow. You know what? I feel that. Appreciate that, Stephen. <laughs> well, I wish you all the best. I don't think it's going to be the last one, but okay. I wish you all the best. <laughs> Thank you, man. Okay.